Oh, weird. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, uh, for showing up today. Um, we're really excited to be talking about live entertainment with our guest, Carson Luter. Um, and I'll let him give an introduction about who he is and where he comes from. He's got a pretty sweet uh, background, as well as good experience with the Themed Entertainment Association um, in particular. Uh, with that, I'll hand it off to you, Carson, and take it away. Let me, uh, oh, you already uh, made a mistake. <laughs> are you able to show your screen there, or do I need to give you? I'll okay. try it again. This is a tradition now. There we go. There it goes. All righty. Eventually. Yeah, there we go. So what's up, guys? Uh, I'm glad to see a lot of familiar faces here tonight. And then some people I don't know. Great to see your faces as well. Uh, my name is Carson Luter, if you don't know me. Um, I want to talk a little bit about myself, but I don't want to take up too much time because I have a pretty lengthy slideshow for you tonight. And I hate when people get into the whole career regurgitation thing. I've seen a lot of those recently. Um, I've been a performer at the parks here in Orlando, Disney and Universal for the past five years. And that time I've done singing, acting, stilts, characters, dancing, parades, shows, you name it. Um, I've also been an entertainment coordinator for Halloween Horror Nights. I did that in 2018. Uh, and then last year, I spent a full year as a event technician for Disney, uh, doing lighting, audio, projection, and video for uh, Imagineering events and Disney event group events and private events and all kinds of uh, very lavish, expensive uh, corporate style events at the convention centers at Disney. In addition to that, I've been a freelance writer for a couple of years, writing for theme park attractions and a couple shows, not as much as I'd like, but a couple shows. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in 2018 from UCF in theme park and attraction management. And now I'm back at UCF getting my MFA in themed experience design. And there's a couple of my friends here from that program tonight. I think two of them I've seen so far. Um, in addition to that, I'm on the TEA Next Gen Planning Committee. Uh, we're the people who do all the volunteer work, getting this program up off the ground and facilitating it. and making sure that these uh, TEA at university clubs get founded and y'all can meet each other and interact and do cool things like the, God, what is it? The summer theme entertainment step. Give me a thumbs up. Is that, is that what it's called? Yeah. Step. Yeah. Great stuff. And I'm glad that uh, y'all have taken the initiative to do that. Uh, I know Zoshi is here tonight. She's very influential in that whole program. Love to see that kind of stuff. Um, Let's get started here. So who creates live entertainment for the theme parks? I think this is kind of one of the biggest uh, misconceptions that people have about live entertainment because, um, I'll show you here. Walt Disney Imagineering and Universal Creative are not typically involved in the creation of live entertainment for theme parks. Uh, using Universal as the first example, their live entertainment offerings are crafted entirely in-house with minor, uh, consultation from Universal Creative. So Halloween Horror Nights is completely done by the Universal Orlando uh, art and design team. Same thing with Hollywood, same thing with Singapore, Japan, uh, on and on. Disney Parks Live Entertainment is technically a subsidiary of Walt Disney Imagineering, but they operate completely autonomously, mostly here out of Orlando with a few executives out in LA. So um, technically, yes, they're related to Universal Creative and to Imagineering in, in most ways, but they are autonomous groups. So when people say, yeah, I wanna go work at Universal Creative and work on Horror Nights, that's a misconception because Universal Creative is building Universal Beijing and Epic Universe that aren't working on Horror Nights stuff. Um, in addition to that, it's a lot, a lot of consultation work from companies like these um, that are either producing event entertainment creating shows, um, and then a couple more here too, that actually provide full entertainment staffs for smaller regional parks. So a theme park, this was the case with SeaWorld, not currently today, 
uh, a theme park would turn over their entire entertainment operation to a company that would supply performers, variety acts, musicians, and all that kind of stuff, produce shows for the park, just because live entertainment is such a niche thing. And it's so different from traditional theme park or zoo operations that these specialty companies are often sought out to do things like that. For example, this Entertainment Central uh, Productions, they do a lot of the, pretty much anything that's an acapella group at Universal, Universal has leased out to this Entertainment Central production. So they're uh, solely consulted for any uh, small scale kind of acapella production just because that's their specialty. Universal doesn't want to waste resources and staffing and performers on uh, this kind of niche entertainment offering. So it's all farmed out. Uh, this is the structure to the best of my knowledge. There's a lot of moving parts of live entertainment. Um, this is essentially to show you kind of the difference of what most of you would be used to seeing in terms of attraction or land design. Uh, kind of the main difference is instead of a creative director, you're under a show director. Sometimes they're called creative director, but most of the time, yes, it's show director because it's a show and you're, the, the product that you're pushing is show or entertainment show, you know. Um, the biggest challenge that kind of pops up in terms of live entertainment obviously is uh, the use of live performers in everything. So you need to cast those performers and they need to be uh, within the realms of the, the scope of the show or the entertainment offering. So there's uh, entire casting teams at every theme park in the world that their sole responsibility is getting these shows staffed and then uh, getting the shows up and running, rehearsals uh, produced and then put out into the park. And then, uh, the biggest difference that I see between attraction design and entertainment design is when a entertainment offering is created, the show director and the creative team lives with that show or entertainment offering for its entire life. If you work at a ride, if you work at, uh, I don't know, Star Tours, the chances of you meeting, uh, I guess Tony Baxter was the good friend. The chances of you meeting Tony Baxter at, at your job at Star Tours are very limited. Um, when you learn a show, when you learn a festival of fantasy or a Phantasmic, the show director that has been assigned to festival of fantasy or Phantasmic for the past 15 years teaches you the show. You're familiar with them. They know you. They give you brush up rehearsals. So it's incredibly intertwined with daily operations as opposed to the kind of uh, imagineering a universal creative method of we uh, design the ride, we build the ride, hand it off. You never hear from us again. We're on to the next thing. Um, the show directors and the the hourly show direction staff, uh, the maintenance choreographers, the performance specialists, uh, anyone involved with casting is uh, a, a daily employee who is involved with the livelihood of the show or entertainment offering um, that they're assigned to. And then of course the uh, the daily on the right there, the daily entertainment operations team is, is very vast and very varied and has a lot of moving parts and a lot of uh, specialty roles. So um, kind of different than what you'd see in an attraction, which is essentially your hourly attractions cast, a lead, management, whatever. There's uh, one person whose sole responsibility is to be a costumer, to be a technician, to drive the parade float, to walk alongside the parade float, to perform in the parade. It's, uh, it's a very niche thing. And it's, it's no surprise that a lot of companies have just uh, gone with a hands-off uh, method for entertainment and let somebody else take care of it entirely. Uh, real quick, I wanna run through some formats for live entertainment. Some of you may know these already, but you know, it's fun to talk about. You got character meet and greets and character meet and greets are kind of the lifeblood of the live entertainment uh, scope for a theme park. I think, uh, I forget who said it, but somebody from Disney um, said years ago, shows will come and go, rides will come and go. There's always gonna be characters. In every park you go to, you're gonna see some, some recognizable character in some format or fashion. So it's kind of the, the cornerstone of themed entertainment, what it all kind of started with and what it will continue to be for the rest of the time. Uh, stems obviously from 
a simple backdrop like you got there at Six Flags, two dimensional sets like the Chewbacca meet and greet or the Shrek meet and greet. And then uh, the thing that I've seen lately is working a show moment. I don't know if you guys have seen the Iron Man meet and greet at Hong Kong Disneyland, but Iron Man through projection flies in, you can see his shadow land and door opens and he walks out, which, um, you know, is a little more interesting than uh, the character kind of rounding a corner and everybody goes, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so giving it a little bit more of an immersive kick and a little bit more of a storytelling kick uh, is kind of the trend that we're moving towards, which is cool. Character dining is obviously a super niche thing that would only exist uh, in a theme park or a, a themed attraction per se. Um, I think the trend with character dining and if anyone has been to the storybook dining at Wilderness Lodge that's pictured there, uh, they're pushing it towards more of an immerse, immersive experience than opposed to it's a buffet and a character, you know, swings by and takes a picture with you real quick. Um, storybook dining was, uh, that restaurant artist point was completely overhauled aesthetically and given new decorations to suit the storyline of this character experience. Uh, new music, new background music, a new menu entirely that fits within the store as well. Um, so I think that's kind of the trend that we're looking for. Obviously this uh, character dining stuff is gonna live on for a long time now. Uh, I don't know how successful it's gonna be now, but uh, it'll come back eventually and it'll be the juggernaut that it continues to be. Uh, you got shows and then um, in this book, you guys are probably familiar with this book, this one. Thumbs up if you've seen this book in your life. Yeah, it's kind of like the go-to right now, right? So that book goes a lot into um, kind of the, the, the topical uh, breakdowns of what a show can consist of. The way I've listed it here is more simple. It's in terms of presentation. Uh, you got your stage show, you got your arena slash stunt show, you got your animal show, and then you got your specialty show, like this ice skating show that, uh, I think that's Knott's Berry Farm. Sure. You saw them at Bush Gardens too. That's where I see nice skating shows. Uh, you got your parades, my personal favorite entertainment offering, nighttime, daytime, show stop parades, which includes the street party, and also the superstar parade at Universal Orlando is, is the same thing. Um, and then your water parades, which is, uh, I think, exclusive to Tokyo Disney Sea, but you know, someone could have one any other day now. Uh, atmosphere entertainment, the thing with atmosphere entertainment, um, that I wanna to explain to you is, I think it gets wrapped up with the whole immersive entertainment uh, trend, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, I have a slide on that. I think atmosphere entertainment uh, serves solely to enhance the story of the land or the attraction that it is placed close to or within. Um, this is, uh, I think the, the first, this, uh, the mermaids of the submarine lagoon, I think is the first example of that I found where, uh, it's, it's not a recognizable character. It's not a character that you find in a meet and greet. It's these kind of side characters or these completely made up characters that uh, their sole purpose is to kind of populate an area and uh, just serve as a visual reminder of the story of the area that you're in. You got your variety acts. And I see variety acts as kind of a catch all for kind of all the other weird things that end up in theme parks uh, we're talking about you know, DJs, pianists, singers, drummers, marching bands, musicians, uh, sway pole performers. If you don't know what a sway pole is, look it up on YouTube, it's insane. Uh, you got magicians, puppeteers, like the list goes on. That, like uh, you've pretty much seen every type of performer in a theme park throughout your life at some point. Nighttime Spectacular is obviously probably the most popular entertainment offering. Uh, I think another common mis misconception too is these are pretty much handled for the most part by those entertainment teams. You think they wouldn't be just because they're so uh, elaborate and high tech, but now a lot of the effort is done in house uh, the way that everything else is done. Uh, you got your firework shows, water slash fountain shows, projection shows, and then your hybrid shows like a Fantasmic or a Rivers of Light when Rivers of Light had performers in it. Uh, Haunts, I think Haunts has solidified itself as a unique uh, entertainment offering uh, the whole format with scare actor populated houses and streets, I think, is unique enough. Uh, the horror made here is not from a theme park, it's from the WB lot, but I think it borrowed a lot of tenets from the Horror Nights uh, 
uh, kind of foundation. So it, it's it's pretty much a theme park production, just not a theme park. And hopefully it comes back. I know it uh, got canceled last year and this year, who knows, but it seemed cool. I never saw it, but uh, yeah, it'd be cool. I know there's a lot of California people here tonight. So uh, hybrid, I see hybrid as uh, a traditional attraction that uh, benefits from live entertainment components. So you got Poseidon's Fury, uh, anything that the living character and initiative at Disney touches, like Turtles Off of Crush, Monsters, Inc., uh, the Stitch things that are all over the world, uh, Muppet Vision, T2. And then I think, again, the first example I thought was the uh, live actor night that would jump out at people at the Haunted Mansion back in the 60s. And then the coolest example, this isn't open yet. I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but this is um, through a company called Legacy. Uh, entertainment and this is uh, coming to Indonesia I think it should be done by now but you know when it opens who knows uh, the concept is a dark ride and it is an oceaneering you know your transformer spider-man that ride system uh, the penguin ride you can say will too um, that ride system but with the added element of stunt performers live stunt performers so you would pull up to a stunt set in a stunt scene would play out in front of you. It's insane. I have no clue how they're going to do it. Uh, there's some pictures of the construction that has happened so far up online. Um, it looks a lot like Mad Max to me. I don't know, <laughs> just from looking at the picture. Um, but yeah, I'm very interested to see how they pull it off. But uh, only rumblings now. It's not open yet or anything. Uh, immersive entertainment. This is the big trend that uh, live entertainment is pushing towards. The main thing, because people will say, oh, it's immersive entertainment. The main delineation that I see between uh, something being called immersive entertainment and something actually being immersive entertainment is the guest needs to be playing an active role in the story. They need to be literally assigned a character role and then whatever actions that they perform should have direct implications on whatever storyline or events are taking place throughout the course of the immersive entertainment experience. Uh, Legends of Frontierland, and then there was a pirate play test, uh, both through Disney. Uh, I think they kind of pioneered what this, this kind of role-playing game in a theme park thing is all about. Uh, Ghost Town Alive at Knox Berry Farm. That's this one up here. Uh, a lot of Wild West stuff. I don't, I don't know why. I guess it just lends itself well to that. Uh, I think solidify that. And then obviously Evermore Park is kind of um, what is looking to be the kind of the, the final frontier of immersive entertainment for theme parks and live action role playing and all that really fun, interesting stuff. And then event entertainment is kind of the unsung brunt of uh, entertainment for theme parks and themed attractions. Um, any, anytime there's a photo shoot or a media filming or a media event, uh, entertainment is involved because most of the time they're going to want characters, performers, or uh, a host uh, involved in some capacity. So that all goes through entertainment. And I'd say about half, if not more, of the work that all those people that I listed before on that big slide with all the names of titles, uh, half of what they're doing on a daily basis is event-based entertainment and uh, private events and buyouts. There are, uh, Disney especially, there are multi-million dollar productions that Disney has worked on in the past year that you will never see or hear about because they're all from private events and they all want, you know, the highest quality. They want a hundred characters. They want a full choir. They want a full band. And that stuff is completely uh, private for the, the company or the, the family or the group that is uh, paid for the event. So I, it's bizarre to me being privy to that stuff as a technician is just insane and it's this whole side of live entertainment that you never ever see just because it's not publicly advertised or public to guests in general. Uh, one thing I wanted to touch on really quick, this is something I'm passionate about, uh, is narrative storytelling in theme park parades. Uh, I wrote a paper last year, <laughs> this is how uh, involved in this I am. I wrote a paper last year uh, for an academic conference about how stories are told over the course of a parade. And I, I mentioned the book that categorizes uh, shows by content. And there wasn't a, a, a vessel for parades to be uh, categorized by content. So I did that myself 
and I came up with a bunch of fun little names. Um, if you're interested, if you have even the slightest interest, uh, interest in delving into my insane parade storytelling mind, hit me up, I'll send you the paper. I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Um, but in that book itself, it's quoted. Uh, you know, in a parade, you don't want to do something with a beginning, a middle, and end. You want something with looping gags, much like a ride. You don't want to do a narrative unless you can stop the whole parade and people can watch it. But then how many times do you actually stop a parade? I disagreed with this. Uh, I think that there's a prime example of a parade out right now that uh, does a, a, a very good job of uh, achieving a narrative over the course, and that's Festival of Fantasy. Uh, Festival of Fantasy is something that's very close to me. It's my favorite parade. Um, I get to perform in it a lot. So uh, yeah, something very special to me. Uh, and I think it's just a, like a knockout in terms of uh, what a daytime theme park parade should be. Um, but if y'all are familiar with the, the monolith or, or the hero's journey, uh, it's kind of this classic uh, storytelling structure that uh, was founded in the early 20th century. Uh, it's a storytelling framework. I think the most famous uh, usage of it is Star Wars in terms of uh, implementing the structure. But you know, you got your ordinary world and it's the park as is with the ordinary BGM. Call to Adventure, it's that uh, the opening announcement. Uh, in just a few minutes, uh, we will be welcoming the Festival Fantasy Parade, whatever it is. Um, the refusal of the call, you know, it's crowded. I, I, I got a bad view, I can't see anything, all that fun stuff. Uh, you meet your mentor, there's literally like a wizard voice that uh, welcomes you to the parade. And, um, is kind of mentor-ish in that situation. Uh, you cross the threshold, it's the, the first uh, parade float that you come into to view. And the, the lyrics of the, song, the song literally begin with, away we go. So you're beginning that, that mental journey that you're gonna follow throughout the course of the parade. Uh, you got your test allies and your enemies. The character Flynn Rider fits uh, perfectly into the uneasy ally or the rogue trope. Uh, Ariel and Merida are the friends that you make along the way. And then there's tests and, and enemies like Captain Hook or the Crocodile that you uh, encounter along the course of the parade. Innermost Cave is the musical transition from the happy part of the parade to the suspenseful dragon unit. Um, things are getting a little hairy out there, you know. The ordeal is the encounter with the dragon itself. Uh, hold on. Seizing of the sword, literally vanquished with the sword, the dragon is. Uh, the Road Back is the musical transition to the happy part of the parade again. Resurrection is that when you wish upon a star musical cue and the return of the talisman, the thing that most people in the world are uh, there to see in the parade itself is Mickey Mouse. So your encounter with Mickey Mouse is the return of the talisman. Um, so that's pretty much all I have. Did I speed through that? I sped through that. So, and Jake, I don't know where you went. Where's Jake? There he is. So what I would like to do right now is break off into some rooms. I don't know how many people we have. So it's about all... 25 right now. Okay. So it's all up to you how you want to split it up. I would like to, this is kind of like a fun little thing we could do based off all the insanity that I just told you. I'd like to build a parade. So and I'm, I apologize if this becomes difficult for you, Jake. No, it's all right. So imagine that we've all been promoted. We're now the heads of entertainment at Six Flags over Georgia. And the, the park management has said, hey, you know, it's our anniversary coming up. We want to do a big daytime parade, a big blowout parade, big party in the streets. Uh, you got a couple million dollars. Let's do something good. Um, so if we could split up, you said there's 25 people. Yep. You want to do five rooms? Yep. There are 24, 23, 22. Ignore me. <laughs> All right. We'll do, we'll do five rooms. Cool. If people want to also just take a screenshot of this as well, because if you're doing your breakout room, you won't be able to see the requirements anymore. I'll explain too, real quick. Um, and uh, nobody draw, unless you really want to like do a little sketch or something, you don't need to draw anything. Just the concept. This is just for fun. It's just a fun little exercise. Uh, a main flow concept, kind of like your, your big show piece. Uh, characters can be riding on it or not. It could just be a big moving set piece that exists and has nothing in it. 
a small parade vehicle concept, uh, something like the Crocodile and Festival of Fantasy or a little car or some smaller thing that you would imagine would either go before or behind the big parade, uh, what characters you want in there, um, your ground unit, so essentially your, your basic parade performers, your dancers, uh, what are they doing, what are they wearing, uh, music, are you gonna have a specific song or uh, just a musical style in general, and then if you want to interact development like a water or uh, people throw beach balls at the crowd, that's a good one too. But so I have five themes for units. How do we, how do you want to split those up? Can you message individual breakout rooms? Yes, I think I can, yeah. Okay, so let's do that. So you'll go into your room and then there'll be a surprise what theme you're going to maybe. Just send those to me then, Carson, and I'll gotcha. uh, shoot them out. I got you. Cool. All right, is that everything then? That's it, and then we'll see what you come up with, I guess. All right, and then just let me know, Carson, when time is good, and I'll call everyone back together. You want to do like 10 minutes? 10 minutes sounds good to me. All right. Ready? I will also send out in the chat right now so you can see kind of the bullet points from his thing and I will open your rooms now.
Well, hello there. Oh, wow. I haven't seen you in like a couple seconds. It's been ages. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so what happened, guys? Anything cool? Brilliance. Oh, um, yeah. All the brilliance things. happened. Big time. <laughs> so, Fantastic ideas. Good. So I will warn you real quick, Carson. There were only four groups in the end. That's fine. So somebody that's not me go first. Somebody from each team choose to talk about your concept. Go for it, Dan. I saw you raise your hand there. I'll share my screen. Oh, I can't. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, I don't actually. You don't need to see it. It's nothing. It's just my no, notes. Go for it. Share your screen. Share your screen. Okay. All right, so here's what we came up with. We came up with the Justice League Stunt Parade. So on our main float, we have, well, we have two main floats. We have the villains on a destroyed city scape, and then we have the superheroes on the completed and safe city. And then our small parade vehicle concept is the Batmobile, because you got to always have the Batmobile. Um, and then our characters, we just pretty much listed all the people, <laughs> the superheroes associated with um, the, the Justice League and whatnot. Um, and then our ground unit concept, we have the sidekicks and evil henchmen. Uh, some of them are riding dirt bikes, but they're kind of walking around and interacting with the crowd a bit more. Um, and they might have a couple like dance offs. <laughs> and then there's also going to be some show stops where the characters, uh, the main characters on the main parade floats actually cross over onto like the superheroes go onto the villain float and vice versa, a couple of them. Um, so then our big kind of finale, I guess, is that there's a final battle scene and then there's confetti that shoots out into the crowd at the end of it. Um, and then just to top it off, there's a, oh wait, I forgot to mention. Um, so there's also a rigging system between the two flo parade floats. So Superman actually flies from the superhero float onto the villain float at one point. And yeah, you can see our music choice. And another interactive element is that Aquaman sprays the crowd because it's a daytime parade. <laughs> that is so cool y'all just ran with it though i don't think that's the thing i don't think there's ever been a stunt parade yeah there's so been sick. like rigging and stuff like you dance in a parade but you don't there's not stunts in a parade that david somehow i knew that you were involved in this one <laughs> <laughs> yes no i love it superman flying between the floats that is the coolest idea and dirt bikes yes big fan of dirt bikes and parades it should be done every time rigging stunts all that i think because if you've ever seen there's been like two if you've ever seen a parade at six flags the superheroes are just standing on the float waving that's it so i think that this unit like very accurately portrays uh, kind of the action that's expected of the property and it is the coolest idea. And the interactive is good. Aquaman shooting water. Yes, absolutely. Why not? <laughs> that's, so, that's so cool. Batmobile. Yes, got to have it. All right. Who else? I think our, our team can go first. If go ahead, Jessica, man. you want to share your screen. She has some images for us. And I will send. So if you see in the chat, I just sent the... Uh, or like what we have here to go with Jessica's screen share. But what we have is Mr. Six comes to town. Um, so the main float is the Six Flags bus. Once Jessica's screen. So if you don't know, there's a commercial. And there's this crazy old dude with these huge glasses who's known as Mr. Six. And he like hypes everybody up to go to Six Flags. So he's that, that old dude right there who's like standing in front of that bus. So that bus that you see in the background is going to be our main float, but it's also going to be at like twice the scale. 
so that it's like enormous and they'll just pass a bunch of actors in there. Um, the characters we have are gonna be all sorts of Six Flags characters. And the idea is that, you know, as you're going down the street, the way the commercial goes is everybody's like mowing their lawn and cleaning their windows or whatever in the town. And then this bus comes by and everyone gets real excited and hops on the bus to go to Six Flags. So the idea is that, you know, you have Daffy Duck cleaning a window over here and Superman's taking out that trash bin on the left. And then as the bus and the music comes by, they kind of turn around and they jump out and join the party. So it's not just like a linear thing, but that it's kind of like growing from within the guest um, experience. And then they take, you know, a kid with them. And so our ground unit is going to be these sort of like dance stages along the path that they then these characters will bring um, these guests to to like immerse them in the experience and give them a role. So then they're dancing with all the like characters on these things um, as the buses go by. For the small parade vehicle, we have six vehicles, one each color of the flags, like you can see in the logo. Um, and with those, they interact with our music so that as each goes by, you'll get a different genre of the same classic melody. Like we like the party is the song he dances to, but each car will sort of bring a different um, form of that melody past as it goes. And then, yeah, I think that's, that's all we got. Is there anything I missed? Uh, I think we also said that some like we'll also have a whole bunch of um, other unnamed characters who will be also dressed like Mr. Six, who will be uh, dancing along. An army of Mr. Sixes. Exactly. Yep. We had a whole Halloween costume campaign. Look it up if you want some um, fun times. I love that idea. The interactive flag vehicles. That is so cool. Like, oh man, this is like, I'm so much more pumped about this stupid idea that I had because y'all just have good ideas in general. <laughs> I love it. Um, the question that I have and like the biggest thing that I always think about is, do you put, and th this could be a question for this group right now, do you put your highest energy or your marquee float slash character at the beginning or at the end of the parade? Where do you put your Mickey? Where do you put your Mr. Six, your highest energy, your kind of zenith of the parade? Where do you put that? What do you think? I think it would depend on the parade. Like for, for the one that we just presented, then you would have, you'd kind of have to start with Mr. Six because it's the Mr. Six parade and he's not necessarily a Mickey Mouse level character. You may need to bring him out first to introduce him. Um, but for someone like Mickey, because you have Festival of Fantasy where he shows up last and then you have Magic Happens where he shows up first and it just kind of depends on the amount of involvement that he has in that show's, in that parade story. Yeah, I think also with this concept, we were kind of structuring it around like the the famous commercial that he's in and that's sort of like the bus is that anticipatory moment. So nothing actually starts until that bus arrives and then he jumps out. So that's sort of where we were going versus if it, I feel like it wouldn't in this case work as well if it were at the end because then you'd be waiting literally the entire parade for it to start and then you're like okay it's over um so yeah again i think it depends on the concept that was the most eloquently ex we had 10 minutes to talk about this and this is what you came up with you're a genius seriously <laughs> you said the anticipatory moment i was like whoa what <laughs> I love it. Um, this is so cool. Okay, so I guess next is whoever had Looney Tunes, yeah. I think that's the one that was not used. Oh, psych. So wait, what was the other one? Because we've done two. There's DC Villains. DC Villains, yeah. DC Villains go. Somebody already stole your idea, but make it better than the other one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'll start and then Alec and Sam, if you guys want to jump in. Um, so the concept of our parade is DC villains. Um, Harley Quinn has just broken all the villains out of Arkham Asylum. So there are smaller elements and like vehicles from Arkham Asylum that roll through the parade first, such as like the Arkham Asylum arc and they're walking around. The more iconic recognizable ones are in their, their suits and they're also people in their Arkham Asylum suits as well. And um, eventually you get to the Harley Quinn float, uh, which is our main float. Um, Sam, do you want to describe it? Um, we didn't actually draw anything for the Harley Quinn float, but um, I imagine it would be something involving her massive hammer 
maybe turned into a riding vehicle as if it was like a, not a riding vehicle, but a parade vehicle, as if it was like blown out of proportion. Um, another flow we did draw though is um, the Jokers, which would be a twisted metal style ice cream truck with a massive jack in the box sort of flower coming out of it, just squirming people. And he'd be kind of standing on top, just, you know, doing his thing. And one of his goons would be driving it, like the little uh, masks. This is an example of the uh, Arkham prisoners, just, you know, prisoner dudes from Arkham. Yeah, and um, the point of it would be like Harley, you know, as we mentioned, Harley Quinn has just broken everyone else. So she's on her big, massive float that's more carnival y. It uses more twisted metal, metals and bright colors and black light. Um, and the Joker is trying to steal her thunder back because we're doing this in the taking place after their breakup where Harley Quinn is like, I want to be on my own and I can be on my own. And so breaking out those villains was one of the things she did. So Joker's following along in his little ice cream truck trying to prove that, like, trying to take back, trying to take back the villains and like show them like he's still the number one villain, like his ego won't allow Harley Quinn to take over. Um, and he'll even like jump out of the car and uh, go talk to guests or Alec, do you want to talk about the interactive stuff? Yeah, some of the interactive stuff we planned is for the Joker to kind of run and go and talk to guests and he'll also spray them with that big flower, like mist it out into the audience, get them wet, pulling pranks on them. He'll run, talk to guests, kind of still trying to prove that he's the biggest bad guy, maybe pieing some of his goons who are running along with him in the face. Uh, and then on the main float, as another kind of interactive activity, uh, we were thinking that Harley Quinn could use her big mallet on a kind of a carnival-esque, uh, like the game where the, you hit it down and it goes all the way up and makes a ding. I don't, there's definitely a better way to say that, but that that activity and then the guests would all kind of gather around and that'd be the big climactic moment where she hits it and it dings and things spray out over all the audience and like confetti shoots out. Um, so that's another level of interactivity, both from the small the smaller uh, parade float with the Joker running around and spraying everybody and then the big, Kind of climactic boom with confetti shooting everywhere from Harley Quinn on the on the main float as well. Yeah. And to and to add on the Joker's float, the flower on top is actually a jack in the box, so it would like they'd wind it up and it'd pop out and then spray people. Because mm -hmm. um, you know, on his suit, as Alec mentioned, he has the flower that he usually because you know what we wanted to play around with like the pranks that they usually do with people. Um, yeah. <laughs> ten minutes. All you had was ten minutes. And y'all just ran with it. It's insane. The the fact that you did like a full like fleshed out story concept within like the single unit. That's so cool. I love when parades do that. When there's a complete same with the other ones too, where there's a a full beginning, middle, and end for each unit. It's not just kind of things happening. There's a full fleshed out story for everything. That's awesome. I love the interactive elements. That's really cool. Uh, I think these are the most popular, aside from like, I guess Superman or Batman. I think. Joker and Harley Quinn are what people would want to see in a DC Comics thing. So it makes a lot of sense. Uh, the ground unit's great. I love the Arkham Asylum games and it reminds me of that, obviously. Um, that's cool. Yeah, I love it. That can honestly be separate from the other DC flow. And then you just have like a Joker exclusive unit, Joker Harley Quinn exclusive unit. I like that too. Um, cool, yeah. Wow, these ideas are so good. Uh, Mike, talk about your idea and I'm gonna show the crappy picture that I drew. Cool, cool, cool. So we started with the musical concept and we were thinking, hmm, what's in Georgia besides Six Flags Georgia? The devil, and he went down to Georgia. So we took that song and made it into a parade. So what you're seeing right there is Johnny up playing on the fiddle uh, hot and you have the devil on a hickory stump and the Hickory Stump is gonna be circling around Johnny and it's gonna be like this musical battle as they're both going at it on their fiddle. Um, and uh, yeah, that was kind of the big main float idea. And then around we'll have line dancers. Those are gonna be kind of our uh, uh, street performers going around and dancing uh, along with some ideas of uh, what we wanted uh, some of the other characters like a granny and a dog and some chickens pecking around and just kind of going around the parade float. And, you know, we probably see the Devil's Band somewhere in there, and we'd probably see Johnny in his own, like, awesome float as he beats the Devil. Um, so, yeah, um, that's what we came up with in 10 minutes. It doesn't seem as impressive as the rest of yours, but it made really us laugh. We were, like, we were hanging out. Like, I was catching up with some people I haven't talked to in a while. Y'all were just like, okay, so we got to get the, we got to do this is the hammer unit, and then we got to do this, and we got to, then we got to get this going, and then there's going to be this happening, and then they're going to jump the dirt bike over the other float. And Superman's going to fly. I'm like, 
<laughs> you just said devil went down to Georgia. Perfect. You just said that and I was like, dude, cool. I love it. That's that's funny. Like, yeah, good song. Oh man, I love it. Um yeah. So I think the main thing, and this was like gonna be a challenge, honestly, was like, how do you structure this like in terms of not creating a cohesive story because it's six flags and obviously like the properties that they have are so different and you're never going to be able to weave an interconnected story through looney tunes and even though you guys kind of did with the first unit where you're like having all the characters come together and then like break out into this song um but i think like the structure was just implied by everybody which is is really cool because that's kind of the, the the biggest challenge that comes to parade design i think um let me sh wrap up real quick share my screen again that was really fun. Like, I can't believe how creative those ideas turned out. You guys are so talented and crazy. Um, I wanted to share with you, because I know everybody's big on uh, bettering themselves and uh, finding new resources for information right now. Uh, these are my four favorite resources about live entertainment production for theme parks. Um, there's not that much. There's a lot of books out about, you know, theme park architecture or ride design, but a lot of stuff doesn't get covered. Uh, in terms of live entertainment. Start with this one. Uh, a lot of you probably heard of Ron Schneider. He's the original dream finder in the parks, the walk around character. Uh, but he did a lot of uh, live entertainment stuff for uh, Match Mountain, a lot of dinner shows, a lot of uh, Titanic experience type things. He was the uh, creative director or the show director for all the walk around characters for Universal Studios Florida when it first opened. So, and he, wrote the Blues Brothers show, which is an amazing feat to have a show written so long ago that is still performing essentially as is today. Um, so a lot of his book is his biography, his career, but the back half is a little mini, this much, is a little mini textbook about writing theme park shows and uh, coordinating entertainment for theme parks. So this is on Amazon, check it out. He's a really well-spoken, interesting guy. Uh, I've had the pleasure to meet him a couple of times. It's a cool guy, a big proponent for immersive entertainment and theme parks. Uh, obviously, it talks about this one. Uh, the live entertainment section in this book is very, very slim, especially considering uh, how much stuff is jam-packed in here. Um, but it's there. If you want to know what every type of firework is called, there's a chart in this book, and it'll tell you what every single type of firework design is called. Um, this is a weird one, and I'm gonna send a link to how, if you wanna get this, uh, you can get this. This is an internal Disney document that uh, Ron Logan, who is a Disney legend, he was the VP of live entertainment for Disney, the whole company, for 30 years, spanning like the period when they put out Fantasmic and Illuminations and all the best stuff, essentially. Um, but he put out essentially a memoir of his work that he did with the company during that time. Uh, he met Walt a couple times. He performed on stage with Walt in the 60s. Um, it's all in this weird book. It's like, you know, it's bound with little plastic rings. Uh, and it's his textbook for if you take his class at UCF, he uses this as his textbook. But um, I will send a link out if you're interested in this. You're buying it through like Barnes & Noble Collegiate UCF website. But, you know, if you're interested in this stuff, it's the man has insane stories about, you know, Michael Eisner and... Uh, he worked on three Super Bowl halftime shows uh, with all Disney content. There was an Illuminations halftime show, an Indiana Jones halftime show, a New Kids on the Block, It's a Small World halftime show. Just insane stories with celebrities and stuff. And then the last one there is a YouTube series. It's pretty old by now, um, probably like 10 years plus old. If you guys remember the Pirate and Princess parties from Magic Kingdom from years and years ago, uh, it's a little mini documentary that kind of chronicles the creative process of creating the parade for that event in terms of like art design and then ultimately casting. And it follows a very uncomfortable, awkward performer <laughs> through his like rehearsal process and eventually his performance process. Um, but I'll send you the link to that too. It's a really good look into DPLE's creative process that uh, honestly hasn't changed much today. It's kind of the same uh, structure to this day. Um, that's all I got for you guys today. There's my email. Email me anytime, weird questions, whatever you got. Uh, TEA stuff, live entertainment stuff, UCF stuff. Uh, I'm all ears, connect with me on LinkedIn. I guess we're over time, but 
if y'all are down to stay, I can answer questions. You can email to me, whatever you want. Jake, it's up to you, sir. You're in charge again. Yeah, we can take a couple questions here. So feel free to just unmute yourself and ask. And then with that link, you can just send that to me, Carson, and I'll send it out on our uh, appropriate channels. I'll do that. Um, so I guess I have two things. Uh, the first was the essay you mentioned earlier, a bunch of us in the chat were interested in reading it. Would that be possible to be sent out? I will send it to you, Zochi. It is a hard read, but if you're legitimately interested in my insane ramblings about theme park stories or theme park parade stories, then you might find some interest in it. But I will, I will definitely send it to you. And I'll send it to you too, so you can send it to everybody. Sounds good. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. Um, I am, I'm fairly new to like live entertainment outside of Maze uh, haunted house stuff. I've done that kind of stuff, but I haven't done too much in live entertainment in the parks. Um, Cause like my family did not grow up like w liking to watch those shows. So like, I find this all really fascinating and I've done a lot in stage tech for the past five years. So like seeing how like that all applies to theme parks is really interesting. And this like whole presentation was really, really interesting to me. So thank you so much for this. Yeah, no problem. It's all super interconnected. And I think people kind of underestimate the role that technicians and, you know, lighting designers and video designers and audio designers play in all facets of theme entertainment, not just attraction design, but also live entertainment. And there's people who exclusively do lighting for theatrical shows, you know. So I'm glad I could shed a little bit of light on that tonight. Cool. Any other questions out there? Oh, hey, what's up? She said you did something for um, Halloween Horror Nights 28, right? Um, what did you actually do? So I was an entertainment coordinator, which is essentially, you have your stage managers, and my buddy David is here tonight. He was the ASM for Halloween Horror Nights and an entertainment coordinator as well. Uh, you essentially kind of wrangle a group of performers, uh, walk them out the set, watch them, make sure most of it is make sure they don't get beat up. <laughs> it's about 75% of what you do as an entertainment coordinator is monitor the sets and make sure they're okay. But it's just kind of like an administrative role in Horror Nights that is uh, overseeing the performers and then reports to the, the higher leadership for the event as a whole. That's it. Good. I ask real quick, what's your favorite part of Festival of Fantasy? Who is this asking, by the way? Jessica. Jessica, okay. Um, so I'm biased to the Maleficent unit. Obviously, uh, that's the unit that I perform in. Um, I like the Tangled unit. That's cool, too. Uh, that's kind of stunty with the, the swinging thugs and everything. I like the last unit, uh, but I think I'll still go with the Maleficent unit for sure. Um, I guess I had a question about like Halloween Horror Nights and those types of events. So if like we're looking to work on that side of the industry, um, how do you have any recommendations of like where we should start besides so there, getting what, involved? Right. Sorry. Besides, I guess like the next level after you start building haunts at your school. Yeah, so we, we have, I'm not too big into the haunt stuff, but I know that we have uh, like a good haunt community. And I know that there's one, what is it? Midsummer Scream is the event that they do out there. I'd say in addition to the TEA stuff, because these people go to TEA events, um, I can, like Zolchi, like you know me personally, I can connect you with some people who work in art and design here um, that work on Horror Nights every year. Um, but they're at those like horror events and start talking to them there. I think the stuff that UCSD does with the haunted houses is like uh, groundbreaking in terms of uh, like spinning, the whole haunt industry for theme entertainment off from just a thing that uh, these multi-million dollar theme parks can do. And now it's something that you can kind of do locally. Um, so I think these people are going to be very interested in those type of projects. So I'm glad that you started to do that. And I know UCF does one too. Um, so I think keep doing that. Uh, these people go to TEA events. They're not as prevalent um, as the universal creative people are, but they're there. Uh, the haunt stuff, the haunt cons and all that stuff so yeah thank you yeah
Awesome. Any other questions out there? All right. If not, that'll be all. Uh, if you're looking to go back through any of this, it'll be on YouTube. So you can find that list of resources on the YouTube video, hopefully by tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, again, let's give Carson a thank you over Zoom for uh, sharing his insight with us. And then definitely do connect with him. He's an awesome guy. If you haven't decided that for yourself by this point, which I'd be surprised if you haven't. Um, all right. Just a reminder that Thursday we'll be having um, a creative development skill session with Zochi, just kind of focusing on what it takes to come up with creative ideas. And then Friday we'll be having a networking night, just all students, and that'll be at 8 p.m. Eastern as well over the same Zoom link. So keep an eye out for those next two events, and uh, I'll be seeing you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, Carson, I just want to say I've worked with you for like what, six months now? And I didn't know any of this. I didn't know you do any of this. I don't talk about it much. But it's uh, yeah. <laughs> Jake, thank you. You the man. I said, you are the man. Oh, huh. thank you. It's my pleasure to put this stuff together. I mean, I'm learning as much. This is really just an excuse to learn all these things for myself. Yeah, it's cool. It's like, cool. Hey, you're professionals. There's all these students who want to learn things from you. I told Caitlin last night, I'm mad that I didn't think of this myself. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's going well. And uh, if you have thoughts or feedback or advice for us on any of it, let me know. Um, bye, Zochi. And uh, yeah, hopefully the one thing that's coming up, so we're doing these networking nights we're starting up on Friday. Well, we're still figuring out the exact time to go with, but we're hoping to like once a month or something like that, bring in professionals yeah. to come in and do like just straight up networking with the students. And then on the off week or whatever, we'll have just all the students getting to know each other more, if that makes sense. I'm going to ask my network to see if they want to participate in that too. Cause I have that's a lot of people who are just talking about. So once we get the date, like I just sent out a poll to the, like our discord channel with like 200 students just to see, you know, like would Sundays be a better time than Mondays or, you know, like what works once we kind of settle on a regular time for it, I'll let you know and ask you to help us with, you know, reaching out to bring in some professionals. Cause I know there's people who are interested. I mean, I've been to these TEA events and stuff and people love to, you know, meet with students and other professionals. So hopefully this can be a good chance to, to build that up and hopefully it's a more comfortable because I know like a lot of kids in like the Notre Dame club I've talked to feel intimidated by TEA events because like everyone seems to know everyone already so right. it's kind of tough to like insert yourself into that um, so hopefully this can be a good stepping stone for a lot of those a lot of those people so that's the idea just a matter of executing yeah no definitely down to help wrangle some people up for you Thank you. And then if you just want to send me an email with that like essay and link to the book, just shoot it in an email and I'll get it out to everyone. Okay. Uh, what's your email? Uh, J-P-L-O-C-H-E-R at N-D dot E-D-U. Okay. I'll send that to you right now. Perfect. Thank you, Carson. All right, man. Have a good night. You too. I'll be seeing you around. See ya.